Okay, I want to make a video on um, something I wanted to make in my previous video, and I want to touch on some points I made in my previous video. I made about arguing and all that stuff and all that interesting stuff. So I wanted to talk about the barriers and the the finite barriers and the bumping and the boundaries. Something I mentioned previously in the video, but I changed the subject to something else. Um, so yeah, the the finite barriers that we're living in essentially are the is the idea of this video I want to make, and how um, we're living in this this empty space. And I mentioned how we're all empty space. But generally speaking, we're just a bunch of space in between atoms and photons, and we're just a bunch of things moving at the speed of light and all that. Get us the good stuff, just bouncing around, spinning around in orbits, and all that stuff. And it makes up a whole, and obviously it doesn't mean that it's not the whole. It means something because the whole is taking up space. Obviously it is. Obviously it is. It's taking up some space. Obviously this is taking up less space than see my skull. But it's taking up some space. It's taking up space. It's doing something. Um, and generally speaking, it's a boundary that's enclosed, like the boundary of my body and my head in this encasement. Like the boundary of a room. The empty space that's in the room outside of myself, the thin air. The thin air actually is, you know, it's not empty space, but it is empty space in a way, you know, it's in a kind of way. Because there's empty space um, here. I'm empty space, not really empty space, but I'm mostly space. Um, there's space here, but it's not really space because the air still has molecules and it's still moving around. I'm still moving my hand through a medium. There's something I'm moving through. If I can speak, there's obviously a medium here too, which is much thinner. It's much more sparse, spread out, than anything else. Um, and it means something. Um, um, even the medium, it has some kind of weight to it, regardless. Um, sort of like me. Um, but then, then, generally speaking, it's mostly thin air. So I'm just as thin as the air, and the air is just as thick as me in many cases, because it has just as much. You know, obviously not just as much, but it has. A body. I have a body, but I also I don't have a body because I'm mostly in space. And I like the air. Has no um, body. I have no body. And just be, like I have a body as a body. Generally speaking, um, to, to, speaking to the space, then space in the room like me, space. Um, generally speaking, mostly, and like the um, the body of me, the air and the medium I'm moving through has body. Um, so, like in many cases, it's um, generally the same thing. In many, in, in many cases, it's when you look down to the atomic or the photonic level. Um, yes, we're generally that. There's not much of a difference. You I mean you're not going to see as much difference there as you're going to see here, at least, obviously. So there's more of a difference in the big picture here, and you know, just because it's, on the small picture it's simplistic and doesn't seem like much, doesn't mean the whole isn't greater than the sum of its parts, and the sum of its parts creates a bigger whole, but the whole means something only because of the experience it has, the good or bad sentient experience it has, um, because generally speaking, on the small level, on the big level, we're experiencing generally the same thing as on the small level, we're just things bumping into each other, and the only thing that makes it mean more is this, in, this sentience, intelligence, reaction, interaction kind of thing that's happening. Everything else is frivolous, pointless, doesn't have much meaning beyond a certain degree or a certain point. It doesn't mean much of anything. Um, so yeah, generally speaking, um, you know, it's just as simplistic here, but the function is using a bunch of more of the smaller parts that make up the whole, and that's what makes it more complicated. And the thing, another thing that makes it more meaningful is the sentience that makes it react. But generally speaking, all we're doing is, like I've said before, and other people have said before is we're just still we're just things reacting and bumping into each other reacting in a deterministic function or fashion and we're just pieces moving around in a boundary bouncing around and that's you know another point I want to make is you know the finite barriers um, I bump into a wall I mean, we can understand that um, I'm in a room or I'm in some encasement it's infinitely changeable I mentioned this in the last video as well um, it's changeable I, I can I can understand that, you know, the grass can turn, you know, dyes can change, night and day cycles can change the way we perceive environments, um, you know, uh, makeup can change how you look, um, all of a sudden you have a mangled face after a car accident, all of a sudden you seem or look different, 
Um, your perception can change. You got a nail rod shoved through your head, and all of a sudden you perceive things differently. Your change. You have, it's night, day, night, day, constantly changing. Something's changing. Perception's changing. The environment's changing. And it's it's just it, since we can't really attribute it much to anything, it's the environment, it's a reaction, your perception that can change because it's a reaction that's helping, a mutual interaction that's helping the change um, that ends up being the end result and how you see is based on not only perception but your interaction based on your perception before and afterwards to the interaction of the environment changing. So your per perception beforehand, interaction with the environment changing and leading to your perception afterwards, leading to a perception, a change in perception overall. Um, so yeah, that's really how it works. Um, so it's just an interaction machine. And I think that really goes back to the interactions that we're experiencing on, um, on a life basis, on generally speaking, um, generally. You know, so yeah, I mean, there's only so much I, I can touch this I can touch that, I can touch the edges of the screen, and I can understand I'm in a boundary in some way. There's only so much you can do, and you can interact with these boundaries. Um, you know, a wall, I mean, really all it is is just me bumping into something else. Bumping into another flat plane. Obviously there's a bunch of smaller flat planes, obviously a spike could go through your hand or a nail, but you're still just interacting with a very small flat plane. Um, that makes up the tip of the um, the, the fine point that makes up the tip of, say, a nail or something that goes through your hand. You're just interacting with other fine points, and that goes back to the simple interaction that we're experiencing on a, um, on a reality basis. We're just interacting with flat points, and it's just a matter of how big those flat points are or not. Um, so really, all we're doing is I can touch. I mean, everything has a different texture. Something seems different. Yeah, um, I can touch... My hands are different than the the clothes on me. Um, you know, there's different things, different textures, but it's still just a simple interaction. It doesn't matter about the texture. It only matters that you're having that interaction. And the texture is frivolous unless the texture affects, say, your sentient state of mind or your sentient experience. Um, the texture mean in and of itself sort of like the color of your eyes. I mean, the color of your hair, the color of your skin, I mean, all this stuff is superficial and frivolous and pointless, and any inner, inner, any distinction made between those things can only be come down to a factual distinction that means um, either can or cannot based on an interaction with something. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. And then, you know, our emotional attachments to these things, if we just look a little harder, I mean, if you look a little harder, you realize just how point. I mean, if you're capable, obviously you have to be. You have to be intelligent enough to be capable of understanding this stuff. I mean, obviously you're not smart enough if you can't understand this stuff. And that goes back to the subtle argument kind of thing. You have to be subtle with these kinds of things. You can't just say you're stupid or you're insane. Um. So yeah, in many cases, it's about um. Understanding that stuff and such. Um. And all those superficial things don't mean much of anything. Um, it's just the interaction they have. And if your eyes are blue, good. If your eyes are green, good. That doesn't mean anything beyond a certain point. It's a matter of the function. And since the function itself, that your eyes or your senses produce, don't mean aren't needed, then it shows that even the senses you're experiencing have no real function other than the function that they're serving you to what? live another day for what reason so that they don't get upset but they don't have to exist either I mean the function is just it's abundant it's everywhere and the function the pointlessness of it is everywhere um, even though the only thing we can do in this in this function is fix the problems that we already have and that's what we're using these superficial functions for is to make us feel better in a certain moment in time or use it to traverse our environment using our senses with the superficial function they serve only for us to survive long enough so that we don't starve to death or whatever it may be or go insane and then that really is another point to the futility is just avoiding negatives is all we're doing if not just completely seeing the superficial nature of many of these things because they don't really have any function beyond you know, their superficial nature of absolutely nothing but to make us feel good for a temporary moment in time before we ch catch up to the, the next thing that we're going to be addicted to and try to chase. 
um, and then go on to the next thing, or it's completely frivolous to begin with. Superficial, or just chasing the addiction. I mean, that's really all we're doing, and it's about attacking the addiction, and that's something I want to mention in another video, is attacking the addiction, as opposed to the things that we're addicted to. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's obviously an important point to make. But it's about these um, barriers. We're just bumping into barriers on a small level and on a big level. We're just doing the same barrier interaction, bumping, moving about. And that's all we're really doing. Um, so I can touch them all. I mean, it's just the same as me bumping it. Obviously, it's not just the same. It's the same generalized interaction. It's just something bumping into something else interacting. I can only do so much to the environment. I can only do so much to the wall before it breaks. I can only do so much to stare at a white wall or a black wall or whatever it may be, just a plain wall, an insane room of just staring at the the plain white walls or whatever it may be. I can only do so much for my mind to interact with that environment before I realize exactly what's going on, like attacking the addiction. Um, it's attacking, understanding exactly what you're attacking as opposed to fighting the thing that you're addicted to. It's about fighting the addiction, not the thing you're addicted to. The function of addiction rather than the thing you're addicted to. Um, and I can only do so much to change. I mean, obviously it's malleable, but I can only do so much before I can recognize exactly while I'm rea reacting. And that reaction then becomes um, kind of, you start seeing exactly how you're reacting. And that can become a problem. When you become a little too aware of your reactions, that's when you start becoming a little shaky and you don't really feel comfortable in your own skin or in reality and existence. You can recognize exactly what's going on. Not just the thing that you're addicted to, but you realize the addiction itself, or whatever it may be. Perceptual understanding, like I've mentioned before. That's what I was talking about. Perceptual understanding, generalized knowledge. And that comes down to a perceptual understanding. I think perceptual understanding breeds pain. Breeds an understanding of reality, and I think that breeding that function of understanding of reality is painful. And with knowledge comes more responsibility, comes more pain, not just from that responsibility, but from the fact that you know so much, generally speaking, of perceptual understanding, because it came from the perception, um, then you really, you're coming from a place of recognizing suffering and understanding all these things, not just from recognizing, but experiencing it yourself. Um, so it means something. Generalized knowledge means more than specific knowledge, I think, because generalized knowledge can help you be more, you, it makes it easier for you to learn specific, but also I think in many cases it can be a downfall because it can make it harder for you to learn things, but in many cases it can be, it's a catch-22 kind of thing. Um, it can be easier and it can be harder because in many cases it makes you recognize too much and make, it can become a hindrance, and because it gets so much, I mean, you start recognizing so much, but in, in another way, um, In another way, it can be easy because you can you, you start off at a much higher. You're, it's like leveling up, right? You're 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 like ten in every level, as opposed to like two, or one, or zero. You you start off really high, and it makes it easier for you to move on up. I guess you already started up right here, as opposed to down here. So it makes it easier for you to. You already have a head start, really. I mean, or you just jump. It's like two, four, eight, fourteen, eighteen. You're jumping much quicker. In many cases, people won't reach that 10. You're, you're at a 10 and you're stuck with it. You can't reduce it. You can't increase it. You can increase it, but you can't reduce it once you know the knowledge. It's a one-way street to the end. Unless you get an amnesia or you make yourself stupider by bashing yourself over the head with a hammer or you're taking too many drugs, drinking too much alcohol or whatever it may be. But it's a one-way trip unless you eliminate it. Unless you go through a bout of amnesia or something. Not necessarily amnesia because since it's perceptual. Um, but, you know, just bashing yourself with a hammer, you know, maybe you can become stupid enough. Then again, obviously, that has its own set of pitfalls and downfalls and such, so that becomes a problem itself. So, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so generally speaking, we're just interacting with the environment. There's only so much we can do with the environment. It's a very simplistic process, small to big. We're only doing the same generalized thing over and over again. We're balancing back and forth. I can only do so much with the environment. I can only touch something. I can only do so much. And even if we, even if it weren't, it were different. The only way it could be different is if I were a ghost and I could, you know, my my fingers can sink into the, the chair. Or my my fingers can sink into the wall. 
You can only do so much to interact with the environment. You can only do much, so much to interact with the boundaries of existence. You can only touch so much the air. You can only wave your hand through the air so much. You can only move it so fast. Um, you can only punch the wall so hard before it breaks, and then you realize, oh, there's something outside of here. And once there's something outside of here, what's the boundary that's holding you back anymore? Because it's so changeable. If you can change it so much, you can only interact with it so much, but you can, you can, you can only interact with it so much. But the interaction, the, the, where that comes from, where's where you, the limited interaction only comes from the fact that you can only do so much to the environment before it can be changed. And once you change the environment, it shows that it's a mad, it, it can be changed anywhere, any, any, any time, generally speaking. It's just a matter of having a big enough hand to change it, and it's changing constantly against our will and with our will. You punch a hole through a wall, that's your will or your interaction with the environment that you have direct control over and it's a direct interaction as opposed to you pushing a button and having um, the world that button be the interaction that causes the sun to stop um, producing helium <laughs> or stops the world from spinning or rotating um, but generally speaking you can only do so much with the interaction of the environment before you realize even your mind and interaction like I mentioned before um, you can only do so much to the environment, and that's where it comes from. It's not because you have so you can't knock a hole through the wall. It's because you can only do so much because you you'll knock the hole through the wall eventually, and that shows that you can change the environment to a certain degree, either be easier or harder. You can change the environment. And that's the point I'm making. Um, and that fact exists in reality. So like night and day, lighting changes makeup changes, you can change your makeup, you can change, shave your head, a person looks different, it's all very changeable. So sort of like lighting, how do you really look? Is it based on this lighting in here, based on this light, or is it based on light outside? What do I really look like? The shape of my face it can change based on humidity, so I don't really look like anything. I, I have a generalized look, I look different to say in this picture, in this picture, this lighting, this lighting, what do I really look like? I don't know what I really look like. Um, but there is a shape here that's constantly changing that I can feel and see and sense. Um, but then again, my feeling is only so much. And then obviously, say an ant feeling me would be different than my finger feeling me because it's different. So really, um, there's a thing here, but I'm never going to really know. <laughs> I mean, you can look at a, a set of geometry on a person's face. And that, obviously, you're just going to be looking at a bunch of right angles. But then again, that's really what we are. It's a bunch of pieces moving. An ambiguous, say, photon moving around, creating a, a shape or a function. But generally speaking, you can't really know other than reality creating it itself. And the reality exists in these functions of light, and light's what creates us. So really, we don't have a really look. We don't have a general look at all. We don't really look anyway. I look the way I do in this camera, and then I look different in another camera. In this lighting and that lighting, I feel different. I based on the humidity or whatever changes environment I scrape my face I have a scar on my face now I mean also a number of things can, different factors can change and you're never really gonna know to begin with even in a single moment in time you're not gonna know because there's no function in really measuring that like I said I think the closest thing you can do is put like a negative of something up but the negative relies on light I mean a geometry I mean that's really how the only way you can see a bunch of right angles you know creating it as, as an accurate function of your face but then again the the um the downfall becomes the right angles that are getting in the way more than the fact that there's um lighting. So the lighting becomes no uh, no longer a problem. It becomes the right angles that are interfering with the actual shape of say the way you look or whatever your reflection in a mirror or whatever it may be. There's always a catch twenty two. There's always a caveat. There's always something that you really it's ambiguous. It exists and it's something that exists, but it's something that we're never going to really be able to perceive other than knowing that it exists itself it's that it exists and how it works it's about how it works and how it exists rather than knowing it exists um, knowing exactly how it exists or how exactly everything's happening at that very moment in time it's just about knowing a general function of reaction and interaction more than knowing exactly what's going on in each each moment in time but I think that's another video too so I think I want to make this video um, in this video but I mean that's really the function I think this boundary idea comes down to, and I'm sorry, this is kind of an incoherent video, but I'm trying to cover all these subjects. The boundary idea comes down to perception, understanding exactly 
I mean, it comes down to this generalized understanding um, of understanding your environment, and that means something. Um, and like I said, generalized and versus specific knowledge. I mean, it can help you, and it can be an application based off of this um, specific knowledge that you had, generalized knowledge. But generally speaking, the more generalized knowledge you have, the more it's obvious that you're understanding perceptually what's going on in the environment, in reality, what's exactly going on. Going on. You're more aware of yourself and your reality. You're more um, Life, generally speaking, is more difficult, I would say. Um, so, yeah, as opposed to generalized knowledge, say in some politics, meteorology, um, art shapes and sounds, whatever it may be, um, you can be learning it in a textbook, you can be good in learning an environment, like I mentioned Einstein was good at learning these things, um, uh, was good at learning these things, he had the knowledge beforehand, and he applied it. Um, but in the environment of school, it's something that wasn't his environment. It wasn't his, the environment he wanted to learn in. It wasn't the environment that it was um, good for him in his specific circumstance. It could have been a number of circumstances that created the environment that made, say, someone like Einstein not be able to learn as well or get as good as grades or whatever it may be as his peers, say, in elementary school or in grade school. But then when you realize he's the only one that might have made a name for himself, no one else in any of his classes, as far as we know, made a name for themselves being a intellectual genius and then physics and so on and so forth and even though he wasn't right in everything you know doesn't mean that he wasn't the one that made a name for himself and realized a lot of these theorems and he's one of the ones that want to figure it out and just because someone else want to figure it out eventually doesn't mean that it's a dime a dozen it just means that eventually this knowledge logically speaking would have been since it's a foundation of reality would have been figured out eventually by someone else and it's saying for the times that's impressive or someone learning it that early or as opposed to say someone relatively learning it later on now as opposed to then but then again we wouldn't be where we are now there wouldn't be a then unless there was an Einstein that gave us that specific knowledge to begin with so obviously that comes down to the idea of determinism the idea of a uh, learning it then instead of before and then is learning it now as to then there wouldn't be the now we have now to learn it unless we already learned it based on something that already happened and that's where you know the contradiction and the whole contrivances of determinism come in is that determinism is the only function that can exist um, understanding this function because something's already happened you can't think of a hypothetical circumstance where it's going to happen now unless you can think of a hypothetical circumstance where something um, where it didn't exist beforehand and since we can understand that it already happened we can't think along the same timeline um, that it's already happened um, that it's um, that something's going to happen based off the fact that it already happened we can't say how would things be now if we learned it now as opposed to then but there wouldn't be a now unless we already learned it then so it has to be in a hypothetical alternate timeline to think of something like that but that alternative timeline would have all sorts of other functions or other things getting in the way all sorts of other things um, getting in the way so that thought experiment doesn't really work in thinking about that so it was going to work that way and that function it was one to one that Einstein would have figured out all these theorems and theories himself because there's no other function of reality there wouldn't have been a now unless he already learned them um, there would have been a now but he learned them and that's the function of the past and the past is when you understand determinism because determinism uh, knowing um, all those things can be applied to the past and just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's going to happen a certain way and once it's already happened it's part of the determinism and we can understand because something happened in the, in, in the past that it has an effect on the future so once something's already happened um, it's deterministic it was meant to happen and just because we don't know something's going to happen doesn't mean it's not going to happen a certain way and we can understand that it's since something already happened a certain way that it's something's going to happen in reaction is that certain thing happening a certain way in the future therefore determinism is the only logical conclusion sort of like you can't have um, a hypothetical circumstance where there isn't learning it now as opposed to then because there wouldn't have been the now the, the now we have now unless the then already happened the specific way based on the premise that we're speaking of so that's another good way of looking at things I guess so before this video goes on for too long I just want to end it that's that's a good enough idea I mean obviously perceptual generalized knowledge all that kind of stuff is important um, I think generalized knowledge or generalized perceptual understanding of reality is more important than specific by the books learning or just by learning having a specialized oh you're, he's a prodigy like Mozart or Beethoven or Bach at piano playing well, that's good you're good at playing piano but that doesn't mean you're smart 
That doesn't mean you understand reality. That just means you understand playing piano. You can be smart. You can regurgitate math arithmetic. That doesn't mean you understand reality or logic. Math's logic. 2 plus 2 is 4, but that doesn't mean you can understand A plus A, E, B, C, C, D. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you're always going to get the A, B right. That doesn't mean you're going to always lead to the right conclusion the right way. You're good at math, but you're not good at logic or words or understanding the specific uh, perceptual nature of reality and understanding how each piece is moving and why it's moving and how it's moving and understanding those pieces and understanding the implications of those pieces and perceiving it a certain way and having that perception be another controlling mechanism of the, the process that's controlling you. Sorry, I'm going back into old fast talking habits. I just want to get these ideas across. Um, so yeah, it's a perceptual thing. It's you know, barrier is moving. There's only so much you can do. Empty space in us. Air, air, empty space. Gone over that already. Um, so yeah, it's just about interacting with the environment. You can only do so much with the environment. And the limitation comes not from the fact that you can't move the environment or change it. It's that it's so malleable. You can only change it so much and interact with it so much before it becomes changed to a certain extent. So like, you can only bash the wall enough before it cracks and breaks and you break a hole through it. If I'm going to say, you know, create a contrived example where I say, what is the definition of a change in, say, an environment? So that change is, say, breaking a hole through the wall. There's only so much you can do when it's all changeable. Perception, night, day, things are in the same exact space as they were beforehand. Um, you know, X, Y, Z axis, you live, you were born here, or you live here, or this is here, or that is there, but that doesn't mean you're in the same point in space, the, the same X, Z axis as you were, you're on the same X and Y axis, but not really, because the plates are shifting and all sorts of things. You're on the same piece of land that's still known mutually as this, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't changed, um, slightly, at least speaking. You know, 30 years prior, does, um, uh, you know, it's 50 feet to the left than it was before, or whatever it may be, you know, all sorts of contributing factors to those circumstances, um, so, you know, all that silly crap, um, so, yeah, um, if I have anything else to say on the subject, I'll mention it in another video, so, before this video goes on way too long, I'll end now, so thank you, and until next time, bye.